following interview was conducted with Michael S. Sloan, Professor and Associate Department Head of Academic Programs in the Department of Aviation Technology for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, June 30, 2010, in his office on campus. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Good afternoon, Professor Nolan. Hi. Thank you very much. Let's tell us about where and when you were born and your early years. Uh, I was born and raised in Champaign, Illinois, a town very similar to Lafayette, where the University of Illinois is uh, located. Uh, I'm the oldest of six children, and uh, we had about five of us in about five years. And uh, went to school over there, went to uh, the was University of Illinois. What high school? I tell you about a little bit about that. It was a small grade school? Or? No, no. It was, it was in the city. Again, oh, it was okay. very was similar it? to Lafayette. Sure, okay. um, went to kindergarten <laughs> through third grade, I think, to the local Catholic school. Then we moved into a bigger house because with the fifth kid, you needed a bigger house. And uh, matter of fact, we were right across the street from the public elementary school. So I finished uh, elementary school and junior high and high school um, in what would be a city very similar to Lafayette okay. and Lafayette Jeff High School. They're, they're uh, quite similar. What was any student organizations or any teachers or your course of study when you were in high school? Uh, there really wasn't a course of study. Any? Back then it was pretty much you took these courses if you were going to college or you took the shop courses if you weren't. Okay. Um, and uh, I guess I... I Probably wouldn't say there was anything particular and special. For some reason, um, my parents don't know why, and I have no idea why. Is I always wanted to be in aviation, and uh, always wanted to fly airplanes and this and that from the day I was born. I don't have any family that showed an interest in that. So uh, you had to go to high school to get to college, and in college so I could do all this aviation stuff. Did so. you go out to the? Didn't your parents like take you to the airport? You do anything like that? Oh, I always no. went to the airports. Huh? When we'd go on vacation. I just wanted to go to the airport. They wanted to go to Disney World, or they wanted to go to here. I wanted to go to the airport. So I could sit out at airports for <laughs> hours, which they thought was a little strange. So all I did in high school was to, actually I finished high school a semester early so that I could get into college and start doing the aviation stuff. Okay, we're, we're now, talk about college. Did you, were you, did you live on campus, or where did you go to college? Uh, no, it was at the University of Illinois, okay. and they had an aviation program somewhat similar to what Purdue's was back in the 70s as well. Um, so you lived at home? I lived, I lived at home. We only lived two miles from campus, and uh, the cost of flying, although it doesn't sound as expensive today when I say the extra flight cost was $1,000 a semester, it was the equivalent of today we charge about $40,000 extra for a student to, to learn to fly. So my choice was live on campus and not go in aviation or live at home and go in aviation. And since I was putting the bill for everything, sure. I lived at home and took all the flight courses. Yeah. Was it a, a program that had been in existence for some time? or Because uh, were, there were, were there many other camp colleges at that no, time? No, a lot came after World War II. Okay. Uh, a lot of land-grant schools. Um, Ohio State, Purdue, University of Illinois, Auburn University, uh, those probably were the big public schools at the time. And coming out of World War II in the 1945-50 range is when all these programs started. Sure, okay. So I started in 74, uh, so that would have been, you know, what, 25, 30 years after Sure, that. okay. What about summers? Did you did you have any internships or did you get some experience in working in the airport? Uh, I got to work at the airport because, again... It at O'Hare? Oh, no, not at O'Hare, over in Champaign. Okay. Uh, as, a, as a local... The nice thing about living locally is you were around year-round. So somebody posted a note up on a classroom saying they were looking for somebody to refuel airplanes. And uh, so, I, so I could use money, so I took the job. But uh, we were in charge of um, pulling all the airplanes out at night, putting the airplanes back in. We ran the fuel service for the, the whole airport. So when the airliners came in, we went and worked with the airliners. It's kind of fun when charter flights would come in because um, you know, whether it was a <coughs> football team or a performer or a, anything, um, we got to do that. And I started that, I think, as a freshman. So I spent four years doing that and uh, 
even while we were there, we had uh, President Ford came in once. And, uh, on Air, when, Air Force yeah, One? Yeah, Air Force One. Reagan came in when he was a candidate. And uh, so by that time, the student, myself and another couple of students had worked there so long, we'd worked there longer than some of the full-time people. Sure. So we got to assist them and do some things. And they what was it like when, Ford, when Ford came? Was it well, actually, the, the before, I mean, if you're looking at it from what we did, yeah. the preparation was the stuff that was kind of interesting. For a week, they're flying in equipment, and they're flying in as primary car and his backup car and I think the backup's car backup and the Secret Service car and the Secret Service backup and they're checking this and all that out. Actually when the president came in for us it was anticlimactic because everything because it, you're moved off the airport and they've got security around so I think we went home. Um, <laughs> but it was neat with all the airplane because all the military transports bringing in all the equipment and so forth and of course when they all left, we got to do the same thing. Sure. But actually, I think while he was here... Did he come to give a talk at the university? Is that Yeah, I, okay. well, I don't remember if he... Well, he was given a talk. I think sure. he might have been given a speech. That might have been when he was running against Reagan. Okay. For his first sure. attempt to get elected. Sure. That's so. interesting. It, now, what type of airport was it? Like the Purdue did have commercial? It's like, it's like the Purdue airport, a little bit bigger, but not very much. Okay. And really, they're... Identical, other than being about two hours from Chicago and two hours from Indianapolis, they've got a little more commercial service. Oh, okay. Where, of course, this airport no longer has commercial I service. Know. That's right. So it was very similar. So, and they had private planes as well? So yes. Uh, virtually the same. Type of really, thing. it's so similar. It's, they're almost partners. Sure. Okay. Well, then after you uh, finished, then what came next? Your well, I actually, before you came to Purdue. I actually got my degree from Illinois State University because the University of Illinois' aviation program was not a degree-granting program. And you had to transfer your credit into another academic program. And one of the strangest things was that I could actually get more credit by going to a different university. Seems a little odd. Um, so I actually went to the uni or Illinois State University, which was 60 miles away. That's in normal? It's in normal. Okay. And, uh I just drove from Champaign every day because I kept my job. Um, and not only did I, I work fueling airplanes, after about my junior year, I became a flight instructor. And they would hire students to be flight instructors. So I had, uh, good I had a pretty good job. And it was, yeah, at the time it was paying, I think I was getting about six bucks an hour finally, which in 1978 was pretty good. That's right. Um, so I kept that job. Now, interestingly, I was also a lifeguard. Uh, I throw that in somewhere. And uh, met a girl on uh, that I was lifeguarding with that I was interested in dating and uh, did so. And she um, was two years younger than me, but she became a student here at Purdue. So um, she was a student at Purdue. Her father was also the head of the aviation program at Illinois which was a little interesting. So I dated her for a while, which was kind of hard to date the boss's daughter, but it worked out. Um, matter of fact, since she was a student over here, when I graduated, I thought I had a job over at the University of Illinois flight instructing, but they offered me a job over here flight instructing. And I thought, beats driving to visit the girlfriend. So I moved over here. Um, the only So the only reason I'm I originally came to Purdue was because that's where my girlfriend went to school. Okay. I uh, didn't know anything else about sure. this place. Um, and yes, we eventually did get married, so it worked out. Um, was she an Ave Tech? Ave no, oh, no, no, she's broker. a restaurant, hotel management, oh, okay. and a dietitian. Okay. okay. So that explains why I'm fed so well. Um, so I ended up moving over here to become a flight instructor for Purdue. Okay. Yeah, I saw that you had done yeah. that. But then, what about, you know, you did graduate work, too. Was that well, I did that after I got back. Um, I don't need to answer, but you, are you going to edit this out? It stopped. Otherwise, okay. I can't. Yeah. Um, it ended up that uh, while I was over here instructing, I had also taken the test to be an air traffic controller. And um, Was this event something? Yeah, it was, it was kind of fun. Because when you're a pilot, a lot of times you go up in the control tower 
to see what they're doing or watching what your students are doing. And um, it used to be you had to take this big, long written test, and they'd get back to you in about a year whether they were interested in hiring you. Well, I took the test probably before I came to Purdue. It yeah. just happened to be so, after about a year of being at Purdue, they called and said, would you like a job? And uh, I always thought it was kind of interesting. And my girlfriend, now wife, was getting close to graduating. So we thought we would try to do that. So I went to become an air traffic controller. And uh, you're up in, uh, what, Lansing, Michigan? Yeah, we picked Michigan. We decided... Oh, you could pick a... Well, you could pick a state. Okay. And we had the choice of Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota. Illinois was too close to home. Indiana, we'd been living in. Ohio was more the same. Minnesota was too cold, too far away. So it was Wisconsin or Michigan. And it just happened to be... Then they gave you a couple choices and... I ended up picking what ended up being a, a nice place, the well, state Michigan capital state, of Michigan. Sure. Right. And again, very similar, Michigan State University. Right. And so I was an air traffic controller from 1979 to 1981. Now, what and type of airport was, was this? A, from, uh, they have commercial um, planes? Yeah, well? I would say it's, uh, of course it's changed since then, but it was sure. probably... at that time. Yeah, it was probably busier than Fort Wayne, South Bend... But not quite as busy as Indianapolis. Okay. Okay. Sort of in the in between. In between, because it's a state capital, right? And it has a university, and General Motors was big up there. Sure. So um, I did it's, that. It's yeah, that airport also served the university like ours does. Yeah, other than okay. they don't have an aviation program, but no. yeah. But so they needed planes. They or whatever, needed sure. So so air there were a couple of air. Actually, there were two or three airlines that flew in there. Okay. So okay. it was a pretty busy airport. Busy enough. Yeah. Right. It's a nice place to learn. Um, it wasn't O'Hare. <laughs> you don't start at O'Hare. Uh, so I did that for a couple of years. And uh, it certainly was very interesting. I enjoyed it. Um, a lot of people think it's stressful, but it was just fun. Um, unfortunately, about 1981, there were some interesting political and labor things going on. And, uh, and it's funny speaking about Reagan again, because he shows up. Right. And uh, the air traffic controllers voted to go on strike, which was illegal. And uh, virtually all the controllers went out on strike, and I did as well, um, which meant we ended up getting fired. So uh, now it's back to finding another job. And although I didn't mind flight instructing, that gets very old after a while. And I could have gone back to that, but I chose not to... Um, and I was doing little odd jobs for a couple of months, and I had called down here to Purdue to see whether or not they had any job openings, and the first time they didn't. And I called about two months later, and somebody had just gotten, I think it was the advisor for the aviation maintenance program, had just gotten ticked off at something and quit, walked out, and uh, I just happened to call. And uh, originally they didn't have a job for me until they realized that while I was in school, I had also gotten my mechanic certificate. They said, do you want to be an advisor? And I said, does it pay? <laughs> and they said, yes. And I said, yes. So uh, we had never planned on moving back, but uh, I moved back. I got the job temporary because that's how they always fill positions. And then, of course, they have the university search and all of that. And part of the deal, I did get the job full time, is that then you would have to get a master's degree at least because sure. I only had a bachelor's degree. So that's when I went back to school at Purdue. And you got it here at I got Instructional it Technology? Or yeah, whatever. it was education. At this point, yeah. I'm, I'm obviously into teaching. So I got my degree in instructional design, but it's a master's okay. in education. Okay. Um, when you So what were your initial responsibilities when you came doing teaching and, and other things? Then talk a little bit about those two courses, that air traffic control. You sort of well, coordinate that program. Yeah, what, what happened is, like I said, when I was first here, I was in the flight program. Right. And then when I came back, it was in the aviation maintenance program. And my job was really to be an advisor. And uh, I was an advisor full time for four or five years. Uh, I did teach a course or two at the time, but they would be somewhat random courses where they would, they're aviation maintenance lab courses. So if, uh, you know, if for whatever reason they needed someone to kind of step in, I would do that because I was qualified. And about 1985, 1986, the FAA 
asked the colleges to set up a academic program for controllers because lo and behold, they were short controllers. Of course they were, they had just fired most of them four years previously. So ironically, I was asked to set up a program to train controllers, um, sort of my replacements, if you will. And um, that was actually the beginning of the third degree we have out here. We now have a degree in aviation management, which is where the air traffic control resides. So uh, initially my job was to both be the advisor and organize and teach some of the courses. Now we were able to borrow some courses from different departments and so forth, um, but the only area we didn't really have any expertise in was air traffic control. So since I'd obviously done that and sure, set up right. the program, um, I began to teach those courses. And then the, the deal was as the students, the number of students increased in that program, we eventually hired a different advisor to replace me in the maintenance program and actually a different advisor to replace me in this one because it went from, um, well, I mean, the first year probably had five or ten students in it, and we're currently somewhere around 210 students. What's so, the uh, career path for them? Is employment pretty good? They either go, yeah, they either go into air traffic control, airport management, or airline management. Okay. And, Do uh, many like to go into this air traffic? Oh, yeah, I have. I, I teach an air traffic control each uh, air traffic control course each semester, and it has between forty and sixty students in it. So, um, I have about a hundred students a year take my course. Not all of them decide they want to do the job, sure. okay. but I would say at least half of them do. Okay. So, uh, matter of fact, I just had to redo our uh, approval for our program at the FAA. And I think we've got, since we started the program, about 150 to 180 students are air traffic controllers. We've had somewhere in the order of uh, five to 600 to 700 graduates out of the program. That's pretty good. They need them at all airports, whether they're, they're na the large ones and even the smaller ones. Well, How small, small I'm being. I think researchers might say it's every airport. No, does. not every airport does. Okay. Every airport down to about the size of Purdue University. Okay, okay. Um, Crawfordsville. Monticello, Frankfurt, they don't have okay. air traffic controllers. Their airspace is controlled out of Indianapolis. It's not like there's nothing sure. going on there, the but traffic. when you only have two airplanes an hour, you really don't need anybody sitting there. Sure. So. Okay, okay. Um, now, now let's move on to associate department head for academic programs. Um, oh, well, that took that. a while to get to that point. Okay. <laughs> um, I was the advisor, like I said, I kind of was the advisor, sure. and we had... Uh, we had three programs out here, the flight maintenance and the aviation management. And uh, there was a lead instructor for each. And obviously I was the lead instructor for aviation management for years because um, I started it. Did some um, people, I mean, managing an airport like this airport, is that what some of the people would do? Oh they yeah, yeah, okay. they would do some things like that. Okay. And I was probably the lead instructor in aviation management for about 12 or 13 years. I mean, I was originally the only instructor. Sure. Then it went up to about four instructors. Um, somewhere in the 1990s or so, um, I decided to switch back to just peer teaching. I was getting tired of doing the administrative work. Right. Um, I did that from probably the late 90s until 2008. Um, we had a department head search uh, two years ago and uh, a lot of times department head searches take longer than everybody wants them to take. And when the one de first department head says he's leaving and you don't have a replacement, they name, need to name an interim. Sure. So the dean asked me if I would be the interim department head and I, for whatever crazy reason, said yes. Um, so actually last year, which would have been the academic year 2008-2009, I was the interim department head. Okay. Um, I'm not interested in doing the department head job full time. I really like teaching. I don't like sitting at a desk doing paperwork. Okay. And that job involves a lot of paperwork and a lot of meetings. A lot of administrative stuff. Uh, more than I enjoy. And so we, we did hire another department head. Of course, the first thing he asked me would I stay around as the assistant department head to help him out. And I said, yeah, one year, which was last year. <laughs> So he asked me if I mean if I do it one more year, and I said yes, but that's it. 
So we'll see what happens. So I'm currently the associate department head. Yeah, My primary good. area is undergraduate education, but right. so we have a department head and an associate department head. Okay. Uh, are, are, are any challenges? Do you, do you advise the students? Do you do the uh, mentoring and the? Uh, so with the oh, program? I don't know. I do all sorts of things. Okay. Um, do they? Come to you for reg do you handle the registration? I don't handle stuff? the registration. We okay. have two advisors that do that. Okay. Although I'm kind of their boss and their backup. Sure. So as a matter of fact, um, right now we happen to be in the freshman orientation week, so the advisors on campus. So if anybody does come out today, uh, I will work with them and, and some things like that. Obviously, if there's some problem that they can't sure. solve, it comes up to me. Uh, I have always taught the freshman orientation class. I've had that class on and off, but really Will this be in the fall consistently, the yeah. I've had it for about 15 years. That's good. So that's not really advising. It's almost a group sure. orientation. So I have about 190 students in class every fall, one or two days a week. That's pretty good. It's all the freshmen. It's kind of fun. Yeah. It's kind of intimidating for some people, but I don't mind. Do you, is the enrollment, how is, is that increasing? Ours has been pretty steady. We have okay. about 600 students. Um, the programs have changed a little bit. The flight program has been very consistent. The aviation maintenance program that has since changed to an aviation engineering technology program has seen a somewhat steady decline from about 250 students to about 150. The aviation management program, of course, started with zero and is now about 200 and we now have a graduate degree, which is only six or seven years old, and it now has about 50 students. That's pretty good. So, yeah, overall, we're consistent. We're not up, down. Um, 15 years ago, maybe we had 500 students. We have maybe 620 now. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, I forgot to ask you, uh, to make a couple comments on your research interests, any special things, any comments you want to make on that? Well, primarily my area of expertise is air traffic control just happens to be that obviously right. um, and uh, I don't tend to do a lot of focused research on that uh, a lot of the real research that's real technical is done by various government agencies and so forth what we tend to be involved in a little more is how do human beings react to things how um, so a lot of times I will be called in on projects as um, providing the subject area expertise. Um, one thing I do not have and probably won't get at this age is a PhD. So I'm not particularly research oriented. Um, there must be a lot of human factors that comes into play here when you're working with that kind of in the air traffic. Yeah, it is. And it's a lot of how the human works and so right. forth. So what will happen is if there's a project on at the university and there's always something going on with this kind of stuff. Sure. Um, they need somebody that basically understands how it really works. Right. And that's what I'll commit and do. Right. Um, to be honest, uh, and this sometimes can be heresy at a school like this, but I'm not as interested in research as I am in teaching and students. That's, okay. um, that's what they're here for. That's your, yeah, your clientele. That, that's, which is why I'm. we have two assistant department heads, one for undergraduate uh, programs and the other one for graduate programs and research. I wouldn't like that job. I like dealing with undergraduate students right. and teaching. Are you a faculty advisor for any of the or, uh, student or clubs at all organizations? Uh, or yeah, as, as a matter of fact, for this, I, I've done a bunch of them sure. uh, at various times. We have a student council out here, and uh, just by fact that I'm in this position, um, this position tends to be the faculty advisor for that. Yeah, that's good. And get that gives you another option to work with the students on a little different, like the faculty fellow program is sort of out of class or a little. Yeah, I've, I, I've done you. the faculty fellow a little bit at times. Um, it, it's gone in and out depending on what I was doing with kids at home and so forth. Sure. Um, and uh, with the classes, I I've rotated around. I tend to get some freshman classes. Um, I do teach the air traffic control courses, which are junior, senior classes. I used to teach the one class that all of our students took out here about their junior year that I kind of liked. It was a survey class about international operations and international programs, and uh, I enjoyed doing that. So I usually end up, probably all the students know who I am. 
I may not have figured out who they are yet, but... But you're one, and they're a lot, yeah, and it's hard yeah. to keep... It so they can identify with you. That's okay. Usually I get them figured out about time I leave. <laughs> oh, look, the um, um, enrollment is... In, uh, we talked about the enrollment, and that's kind of low. The graduate program seems to be increasing. It's increasing say? a little bit. That, okay. That's uh, what it is for us. It didn't... Sure. Again, it's kind of like... Starting the management program, it didn't exist ten years ago, right, yeah. and now it has 50, 60 some odd students. Um, aviation is a reasonably new, and I would call it an immature field. Unlike, I mean, chemistry and physics have existed for thousands right, of yeah. years. Aviation is really just a little over a hundred years old. <clears throat> so until recently, I would say even till twenty years ago, having a bachelor's degree was somewhat uncommon. Uh, most people joined the Air Force, got to be a pilot, and got a job doing something in aviation. It's only been in the last two decades that getting a degree is the normal way. Um, well, you certainly have no need for a master's degree if most of your people don't even have a bachelor's degree. Right. And uh, But as the industry has progressed, it's been obvious again over the last decade or two that someone, some organization should do master's degree. So there's there's probably two or three universities that do really aviation-oriented master's degrees, right. and then we're one of them. Right. In the state of in, uh, Indiana, does any other school offer an AVTech program? Indiana State offers oh. a bachelor's degree in okay. flight and management, and Vincennes University offers an aviation maintenance program in Indianapolis, and Ivy Tech has a maintenance program in Fort Wayne. Oh, okay. So, but, but their enrollment is certain, probably not as large as Purdue's. No, they're not as large. They haven't been around, obviously. I mean, Ivy Tech hasn't been around sure. as, as long. Um, we have essentially four programs, the three bachelor degree programs and the master's. At best, Indiana State only has two. Okay. So just, yeah, by sheer right. size right. Yeah. And, and age, we're, we are large. Right, okay. Um, the One of the things the FAA approved it's an air traffic collegiate training initiative. Yeah, they Make decided a, comment, uh, a little bit for the research. Yeah, um, kind of back again. It's ironic sure. that when they when they realized they didn't have enough controllers, they also realized that when they were hiring controllers and they were just picking people from interviews or however they did it, they weren't doing a very good job because a lot of the controllers who they hired three or four years into their training would end up not being able to pass the training. To work at a fairly large airport takes three to four years to learn how to do that. And uh, the FAA was losing a lot of people in that second or third year to the point where they would hire four people to get one. Uh, what was the reason for and, it? Too stressful or just didn't? Or uh, not capable. Oh, okay. uh, there's a lot of things you have to be able to do to be a controller and Kind of like you know, being a student. There's a lot of things you have to be able to be good at to be a student, and how do you tell whether or not you can be right, one? Right. And do you actually get in there? Do you yeah. actually get in there? And again, that job. I mean, aviation's only a hundred years old. Air traffic control is probably really only forty years old. Sure. So you only have one or two generations of people anyhow. And of course, the technology is changing right. dramatically. So they used to just hire a thousand people and hope to get two hundred out of it. And they decided in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, that there might be a better way. What they did is they historically went back and they looked and they said, well, who, where have we been getting people where it's worked? And obviously there were some aviation programs and they kind of went back and they tried to identify common aspects and they really couldn't other than you had to graduate from college and that takes a certain amount of willpower. And you had to have a good background in aviation. So they created a program they called the Collegiate Training Initiative where they asked schools to apply to create programs that would do both of those things, do a basic introduction to aviation and um, be a college degree. And obviously we were already doing that. Sure. It didn't take much. We needed to add a course or two. Sure. Right. But uh, there were 13 schools that were originally approved and we were one of them. So we've now been at it for about tw 20 years. They're coming up on about 20 years of this. Good. The program has since expanded to about 30 schools, but we're one of the 13 originals. 
when they finish, do they have they have to be certified? And uh, and you were certified for quite a while. Technically, they're not certified. Okay. The only people oh. who can certify you is the FAA, and they only okay. certify those people that they hire. The so FAA hires. Yeah. Okay. So our students are eligible to be hired, and if hired, and they usually are, they will then be trained by the FAA and then issued the license. Okay. Um, the certificate, all FAA certificates, and I hold an air traffic control certificate, I also have, as I said, the maintenance, and I have all the pilot certificates. You actually have to go out, if you want to get a pilot certificate, you have to take an airplane out and take a check ride. You have to show them you can fly. So I've done that a couple of times. And when, when you got your maintenance license, you had to work on some mechanical things. But it's pretty hard just to go out and be an air traffic controller to show you can do it. I would, I would, that's a good yeah, question. there's no real way to do that. So the only way you do it is if you're hired by them. So for instance, once you're hired, you go through all sorts of training, and most of the training is on the job. And finally, after you've been doing the job for a while, they spend the last half hour and they check to make sure you're okay at it, and then you've passed your check ride. Okay. So the only way you can really do it is work for the FAA, I guess, unless you owned your own airport and bought your own tower. But nobody's done that yet. No. I don't think so. Yeah. yeah. What is, is there still, is there a high turnover in traffic controllers? Or uh, not or particularly. Traffic? It's, it's uh, I hate to say it's rumored to be a high stress job. It's not a low stress job. Right. Yeah. Um, it is not some sort of crazy job where they go nuts and everybody becomes alcoholics and they lose their sure. mind. Um, there must with, be a little pecking order for some of the top ones. Like well, there is, and, 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 and uh, not to disparage other career activities, but I can find you non-stressful jobs, as I tell the students all the time, and I also think they're boring. It is not a boring job. It is an interesting job. You have to be able to make decisions. You have to be very confident in your decisions. And you have to be very careful in making And you have to be able to follow the rules, and yet you still have to work your way out of problems without getting flustered because things go wrong. And if you're the type of person that is unsure of themselves or can't make decisions or constantly second guesses or feel comfortable, or feel comfortable you, have to, you have to go in confident to the point of being cocky. Yeah. Most air traffic controllers are pretty cocky. Now, you don't want them to be cocky without reason. On the other hand, if you were going into work at O'Hare with the attitude that I might screw up today, you're probably not going to psychologically last. I always went into the job going, I can do this, this is easy, and this ought to be fun, let's go. And that, if you have that attitude, there's not a lot of turnover. Right, right. But I'm point. sure there's a lot of turnover in emergency room things. nursing right. and things like that, but some people thrive on it. Right, exactly. Um, let's talk about the new training airplanes that are coming to and the um, database of what you're going to be looking um, at. This is something new research. Yeah, just we, we, just, we just started, again, when I was the interim department head, one of the things I wanted to, to do um, was replace our, our uh, fleet of aircraft. We, as part of our program, obviously teach students to fly. Now, um, we want them to do more than just fly. We want them to be airline presidents and things like that. But you can't do it if you don't understand the business. Uh, aviation is very conservative. They don't tend to jump on the newest trends immediately. Um, the last thing you need is the newest copy of Windows or something running your airplane when it locks up. You want something that's tried and true and you know and you understand. And um, frankly, many of the airplanes of 10 years ago don't look a lot different than the airplanes of 40 years ago. The same instruments, the same controls. Really, we've gotten better at building them, but they're the same thing. Right, and they've been tweaked a little bit. And they've been tweaked a little sure. bit, and, and obviously, I mean, you don't want to screw around with something that works. Matter of fact, not only does it work, we've made it safer every year, so you don't just throw that out. Right. But probably in the last 15, 10 to 15 years, the electronics revolution has gotten into aviation, where you don't have mechanical gauges, you don't have knobs that turn things, it, it's gone. We're comfortable enough now with touch screens 
and television screen displays that that could go into airplanes. And also being able to put electronics like your laptop and things on the plane. On the you, airplane. And you can use them in flight. Yeah. And again, 20 years ago, this was new. And, and anybody who owned a computer 20 years ago would tell you that you wouldn't want that guiding your airplane. Now, the computers run our phone system, run our banking, run the registration at Purdue. We couldn't live without them. And they're reliable enough that they can run airplanes. Right. They've gotten into the airliners, but they were still quite expensive. Only in about the last six years have they gotten to where airplanes can be electronic, or small airplanes, training airplanes. We bought our last fleet of airplanes about eight or nine years ago, and the timing was just such that it was about three years before this revolution, and I can't predict revolutions like anybody else. So it was about time to say, well, it's time to join if you will, the revolution. Okay. So we've we pretty much got rid of all of our airplanes, or we're in the process of it, and buying an entire new fleet, and buying all new simulators that go along with it. Now, we've never done that out here before. We have typically bought uh, things piecemeal, or as we could get them. Um, this entire deal is about a $15 million deal. So myself and one of the other assistant department heads spent the year I was an interim department head working this out. Right. Um, takes a lot of planning. Takes a lot of planning. Right. It also takes a lot of buy-in from the faculty. They don't right. They don't want to change. Um, even if they know they have to, none of us want to. Um, so this was kind of a campaign that took about a year or more to get done. And a lot of people didn't even believe we'd pull it off in today's economy and so forth. The ironic thing is, as I said, I was the interim department head. The new department head took the, over the position on July 1st of 2009. Um, we signed the deal and sent forward the proposal for all the new airplanes to the treasurer and the provost the end of June 2009, the day before he showed up. And then I left the job as interim department head. I don't think he regrets that, but, but quite frankly, had we not done that, I don't think that it would have gotten done because it would take another six months to explain everything to the new department head. Um, the economy essentially imploded about a year ago, about two or three months after we, we got this deal through. We were able to sell our used airplanes at a pretty good price and buy our new airplanes at a fairly discounted price. That was a kind of a once-in-a-lifetime chance to do some things. You had a short window and you were able to take advantage and, of it. And, and it was a window we were lucky we didn't know it was going to happen. The university supported us 200% on this one. Um, as we explained what we were doing with the airplanes, um, part of the problem in this $10, $15 million venture is sometimes you have to buy airplanes before you sell the old ones. Um, and we had a, we have a sound fiscal plan, and it's going to work. But frankly, the treasurer and the provost in particular, and through the, the meeting of the university president, they said, go ahead and do it. We'll cover you. Um, which really makes it easy to do a job like this. Versus if we'd had to sell our airplanes first, then buy new airplanes. Airplanes take six to eight months to make. Our simulators... And one of the new jet airplanes we're going to buy takes 18 months. Well, we, we have to put a down payment on them, but you, it, it's like trying to buy two houses at one time. The university said, we support you, go ahead and do it. So all the airplanes are coming in this summer, the summer of 2010. Simulators will be coming in over the next year, and we'll be replacing our high-end jet uh, within the year as well. All airplanes that are electronic, they're electronic panels, they all look similar, and that's one of the keys to this is every one of our students will get certified to fly the jet. Um, we will be the only place in the country, and frankly, I think, you know, seriously, the only school in the world putting 20-year-old students as captains on jets, and they will be qualified to do it because the electronics are identical all the way through. Mm. The only difference is the airplanes they learn to fly in only fly 150 miles an hour the jet flies 300 miles an hour they but the controls are the same the buttons are the same so 
they should be able to learn this. The other thing we're going to do is anything that can be displayed on a digital screen can be recorded. Um, there are yeah, there's about 150 parameters that go through the the control panel, and um, they're recorded once a second, and they are stored. Now, typically, it's stored simply to go back if there's a engine problem or something they can go back but what we're going to do is we've actually contracted with somebody where the data gets stored immediately transmitted when the airplane lands. Uh, the airplane will land, taxi up to our hangar, we're going to put a Wi-Fi antenna outside and all that data will get transmitted immediately and uh, we are going to start evaluating what happens on flights. Uh, we've set up what we call a data center and uh, that's actually my new task. I'm in charge with getting that running. And it'll all be students. So we'll get um, basically a spreadsheet of 150 parameters once a second out of every student's flight. And part of it is we can see what they did. And that's really not the point. But we can see, were they getting better? Were they getting worse? Was something happening to the airplane? Uh, you can get a snapshot of what's going on. Snapshot once a second, right. um, where uh, maybe an, uh, an engine overheated. And that happens all the time. Engines overheat while you're driving your car and you don't know it. Right. But now we'll know it. So maybe we can go check the engine out before there's a problem. Maybe if the student has a slightly hard landing, he doesn't know it's hard. He just thinks it's a student landing. But we'll be able to go back and say, yes, he did, and here's the reason why. Mm -hmm. So we can feed that back to his instructor and say, okay, on next flight, watch this. Okay. Uh, typically, w what you do in any kind of training, and it's all like driver's training or something like that, you, you teach something, then you let them do it while you watch, then you let them practice. And that's what we do here. And practicing is going up by themselves. Well, then when they come back, you make them do it again to see if they've learned anything. We aren't going to have to do it again because when they land, it'll tell us how they did. And it'll tell us down to the microsecond, microfoot, micro everything. Matter of fact, we're going to have so much data, we don't know what to do with it yet. Um, but we but should be able it. to look at it. And uh, that's probably my next project for the next five years is figure out what we do with this and how students can... Right. interact with it. And what's its impact on the, the training and the education and your program? Well, training, education, Should... our program, other people's. Right. Uh, again, even the manufacturers, this is new. That's why it's, it's taken us a little while to do it. No one's ever tried to do this before. So we may be able to go back and uh, uh, there are regulations for flying just like driving where you have to be so old and so many, so many hours of, of training. Well, those numbers have been in existence since the 1940s. Are they still valid? Mm -hmm. um, what if we find that students can master maneuvers in half the time and we can actually show that? Then maybe they can work on something else. Mm -hmm. So there's um, a lot of benefits and out, out, uh, outcomes from this. Oh, I, yeah. For, right. for the first time, we can actually measure physical performance of the airplane. Right. Very good. We'll have to do a follow-up on that. That's, that's very good. When I get it working, come I back in a I couple will. of years. <laughs> uh, and you, you still have some, You still belong to those professionals of the Air Traffic Control Association. So oh, I'll those. always be in the Air Traffic Control thing, so I'm going to continue <laughs> to teach that. Any yeah. awards and honors that you wanted, that you could mention? Anything special? Um, every, and I don't even remember them, uh, every couple of years, it seems that the... The students do a lot of awards where they give the best tenured instructor and the best um, uh, non-tenured instructor in that, and I think I've won that a couple of times. Teaching um, is Teaching. Yeah, students. it's teaching. That's good. Um, and actually, I haven't done any of those since I've become an administrator because I'm in charge of the group that picks them, and I'm not going <laughs> to let them pick me. Um, so that's kind of neat. That's kind of nice. Um, do you have a Purdue tradition that comes to mind? I don't know if I have one. We have a couple. We <laughs> uh, don't have to have one. Yeah, so far my Purdue traditions, my kids go to school here. Okay. Um, At Purdue? But yeah, my oldest daughter just graduated with a degree in computer graphics technology, and my youngest son is starting in industrial technology. Okay. So I do have a middle daughter who's going somewhere else, so otherwise I'd have three here at one time. Okay. 
But uh, I was going to ask you about family, and uh, so you told me that the children come here to school. Which is what's she going to do? The one that just graduated. The one that she graduated in computer graphics technology, and she has a job in Indianapolis working with a company that basically does database management, Good. and she's doing consulting. The middle kid, who is not a student here, um, she is a junior in the U.S. Coast Guard Academy, and she wants to be a helicopter pilot and wants to be an astronaut, and she probably will be. And my youngest son is 18 years old and doesn't know what he wants to do yet, so he'll figure it out. <laughs> Sounds good. Oh, but with the tradition, then that, that's sort of nice. Do you have an outstanding event that you'd like to share? Come to mind? Again, I don't know that there were any outstanding events. Oh, at something that comes um, to mind. No, it pro I, I hate to say probably uh, not related to Purdue. That's okay. Um, it doesn't have to be a Purdue thing. One of the things I got dragged into and literally dragged into years ago when my middle daughter, who's now 20, was seven, and my son was five. They both did it at the same time. They decided they wanted to play soccer in town. So I signed him up for the soccer league. And uh, I always put down on the sheet that if, if you ever need any help, I'll volunteer to help out. So they called and said, would you be the coach? And I said, no, I will not be the coach because I do not know anything about soccer. And they said, well, will you help until we find a coach? And I said, sure, because I was stupid and I didn't realize that means they now have a coach. Um, <coughs> so after about two weeks when I realized they haven't sent the coach, I am the coach, so I go down to the library to find a book that explains the rules because I really don't know anything at all about it. <laughs> I had my daughter's second grade class, and I had every girl in her class was on the team, which was kind of neat. Well, this I ended was up, girl soccer. This right? was girl soccer, but I was also helping my boys soccer team, <laughs> and my oldest daughter played soccer. So, um, in fact, my oldest one, Linda, was asked to try out for the Purdue team. She ended up just barely not making it. She could have made it, but it would have taken all her time and she decided she wanted to be in some other things, band and so forth. My middle one still plays. She's on the college team at the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. But I ended up, I ended up coaching her and some of the kids in her class all the way up through high school. So, uh, matter of fact, I had them spring, fall, and winter. We took summer off, and I figured out once that I coached her and a couple of other girls um, something like 29 different seasons. And actually, so I guess my outstanding event was I ended up coaching one of the, the high school here, Jeff High School. I was not the head coach because I really don't know what I'm doing, but I'm kind of the parent that helped out because I'd had these. And my daughter was a goalie, so I helped her be a goalie coach and so forth. Um, during the senior year, um, there were still four girls on the high school team that I had coached okay. since second grade. And they were all playing together in the last game. And there were four girls on an opposing team, West Lafayette's Harrison High School, who I had also coached. So at the end of the game, they came out and uh, we had our pictures taken. And uh, that probably meant more to me than some other things is, yeah. is all these kids that went all the way through right. and uh, to see that you had eight kids that you've Ooh. been working with since they the were way. seven they went all the way yeah was kind of cool yeah that's really nice very good congratulations now you can enjoy it even on the tv right because a lot of people don't you know and uh, don't know that much about it oh yeah but i can sit there and watch on the world cup and <laughs> right. hey, um yeah you do kind of enjoy it now so it's kind of fun <laughs> Um, in closing, anything I forgot to ask or anything that you'd like to say in closing? Uh, no, I, I guess the only other thing that, that I probably hadn't mentioned before that was kind of neat that we started here is uh, about seven or eight years ago we discussed uh, our students really needed to get out more in the world. and um, in the, Within the and community? The, no, global, just... Globally. The aviation is a global industry, and we have a lot of students that have never been outside the state of Indiana much less outside the United States. Right. <clears throat> so I got kind of drafted into this, but it, but it worked. I now, myself and one other faculty member, and it's kind of rotated a little bit through the years, but I've done most of them, take a group of students to uh, Europe every spring break. And uh, we take about 30 students, and we go to, uh, we fly into London, 
We do the London historical stuff. Uh, we go out to the Greenwich Observatory because that's Greenwich Mean Time and all that. Right. Take them to their equivalent of the Smithsonian. We then, uh, and they get a little free time. Then we go take a ferry across the English Channel to Normandy and we spend uh, one day touring all the uh, historical D-Day areas. Then we take them to Paris. We take a high-speed train to Amsterdam because they need to realize there are trains and Amtrak is not always really trains. Uh, we do some things in Amsterdam. The guy I work with happens to be Dutch, so it works well. Um, we go to the Van Gogh Museum type things. We go to the Anne Frank House, which is kind of neat because most kids have read the diaries you know, of Anne Frank, and um, it's frankly pretty moving to go through that house mm -hmm. and come back. So I've now done that, I think, about seven times. Um, we do it over spring break, and my deal always was if, if I'm going to give up my spring break, I'm going to take one of my kids with me. So every one of my kids has done the trip twice. That's nice. Um, it only cost me airfare because they can stay in my hotel room and sure. food and things like that. Right. Um, and we've now we've now figured out that we've taken probably 150 to 180 students on this, and uh, there are a fair number of students who, at the end, um, we'll we'll say honestly, you know, they're, they're really glad they did it because they would never consider doing it themselves, but they did it because we went along, and now they're going to do it again That's on nice. their own. That's nice. And so you know you've done something. Do any of them uh, apply for uh, jobs with International Airlines or? Oh yeah, I mean that's that's really either with or with the international part of okay. of a U.S. airline. Okay. And anymore it's hard to say what, what's an airline sure. and what isn't. Right. Uh, right. Delta Airlines merged with Northwest Airlines that had a partnership with KLM and Delta has a partnership with Air France. Yeah. Right. So if you work for Delta you could be really working for any four of those so that the business is international and they need to know it. Sure. That's so, a great uh, idea. That's very good. We enjoy doing that. I'll have to sign up for that trip. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate this. Very Certainly. Good. Very nice. Uh, uh, um, I have a little little story. Uh, a colleague's daughter who works for the CDC in Atlanta came to visit us about a year ago and uh, she gets off the airplane in Indianapolis and she sings to herself in today's times, it's physically impossible to get on the wrong plane. You simply cannot, oh, yes, you do, can. you cannot do that. So she goes up to the information desk and she says, what city is this? And they said Indianapolis. She did not know there was a new 